Good afternoon, class. Today's, um, today's lecture is Unit 5, Chapter 23, Part A, the Digestive System. Function of the Digestive System. So we all need a regular supply of nutrients in our diet. Uh, some of those compounds are broken down for energy, but may many eventually become part of us building blocks of our cells, tissues, and organs. Unfortunately, the nutrients in food are not ready for use by our cells. Without processing by the digestive system, food would be of no use, more, of no more use to us than a lump of coal in the gas tank of a car. So the main functions of the digestive system is to take in food, break it down into nutrient molecules, absorb the molecules into the bloodstream, and rid the body of any indigestible remains. The digestive system uh, consists of a muscular tube, the digestive tract, also called the gastrointestinal tract or alimentary canal, and various accessory organs. Okay, so let's start part one, uh, our overview of the digestive system. Okay, so a um, alimentary canal or gastrointestinal or GI tract or gut is a continuous muscular tube that runs from the mouth to the anus. Uh, it digests food, breaks it down into smaller fragments, and absorbs the fragments through the lining into through a lining into the blood. And the organs uh, are the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and the anus. Accessory digestive organs include the teeth, the tongue, the gallbladder, and various glandular organs or digestive glands that produce secretions that help break down foodstuffs. Uh, these include the salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas. Uh, so these um, so so these secrete uh, their products into ducts that empty into the uh, digestive tract. Uh, so the food enters the digestive tract and passes along its length, and on the way, the secretions of the glandular organs, which contain water, enzymes, buffers, and other components, assist in preparing organic and inorganic nutrients for absorption across the epithelium of the digestive tract. 23.1 shows the alimentary canal and related accessory digestive organs. So if we look at the, uh, if we start with how you know food enters the mouth the oral cavity in the mouth there's the tongue and there's um uh, secretions from the salivary gland so there's the uh, parotid gland the sublingual gland the submandibular gland uh, that empty their contents into the mouth then from there there is the uh, pharynx so the pharynx remembers the back of the mouth the long esophagus that brings it into the uh, stomach then from the stomach, we have uh, the uh, three components of the small intestine, the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. And then we have the components of the large intestine, which is the, uh, the uh, ascending colon, well, first the cecum, then the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, uh, the sigmoid uh, colon, uh, which is the lower portion uh, of the colon, the rectum, and the, uh, anal, uh, the anal canal and the anus. And then uh, we also saw, the uh, we can see the liver and the gallbladder. Remember we did this in the lab. We talked about uh, the gallbladder and the liver and how the gallbladder stores bile. Uh, there's also the pancreas, uh, which is underneath the uh, stomach, uh, underneath the stomach. Section 23.1, Digestive Processes. So the processing of food involves six essential activities. So let's start with the first one, ingestion, or simply eating. So this occurs when materials enter the digestive tract via the mouth. Ingestion is an active process involving conscious choice and decision making. The uh, second uh, activity is propulsion, which is the movement of food through the elementary canal, which includes swallowing and peristalsis. And peristalsis is the major means of propulsion of food that involves alternating waves of contraction and relaxation. Figure 23.3. 
A is peristalsis. So in peristalsis, adjacent segments of the elementary canal organs alternately contract and relax. So food is moved distally along the tract, primarily propulsive. Some mixing may occur. In uh, uh, mechanical breakdown, uh, this includes chewing, mixing food with saliva, churning food in the stomach, and segmentation. And segmentation is local constriction of the intestine that mixes food with the digestive juices. Um, we can see that in the figure B of 23.3. Uh, this process is explained in the figure where it's non-adjacent segments of the elementary canal organs that contract and relax. Um, so mechanical processing is, so it, it involves crushing and shearing that makes materials easier to propel along the digestive tract. Uh, it also increases their surface area, making them more susceptible to enzymatic uh, action. Uh, mechanical processing may or may not be required before ingestion. You can swallow liquids immediately, but must process most solids, solids first. Uh, the tearing and mashing with the teeth, followed by squashing and compaction by the tongue, are examples of preliminary mechanical processing. Swirling, mixing, and churning motions of the stomach and intestines provide mechanical processing after ingestion. Uh, Next is digestion, which is a series of catabolic steps that involves enzymes that break down complex food molecules into the chemical building blocks. So, um, uh, for example, um, you know, the break breakdown of complex proteins, polysaccharides, or triglycerides. Uh, these molecules must be disassembled and by digestive enzymes prior to absorption. So for example, the starches in a potato are of no value until enzymes have broken them down to simple sugars that our digestive epithelium can absorb and distribute to our cells. Uh, next is absorption. So passage of digested fragments from the lumen of the GI tract into the blood or lymph. So absorption is basically the movement of organic substances, electrolytes, vitamins and water across the digestive epithelium and into the interstitial fluid of the digestive tract. And then there's uh, defecation or egestion. Uh, it's the elimination of indigestible substances via the anus in the form of feces. In figure 23.3, peristalsis and segmentation. So now we're looking at uh, figure B. So in this case, non-adjacent segments of the elementary canal organs contract and relax. So food is moved forward, then backward, primarily mixes food and breaks it down mechanically, and some propulsion may occur. This is summarized in figure 23.2, gastrointestinal tract activities. So we start with ingestion of food. Uh, and um, then mechanical breakdown, so there's chewing in the mouth, churning in the stomach, segmentation in the small intestine. Uh, propulsion is uh, swallowing um, peristalsis, uh, you know, at the level of the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. And then there's uh, digestion uh, in the stomach, small intestine, uh, and then there's absorption, at the level of the small intestine and uh, large intestine uh, into blood vessels and lymph vessel. And then there is the uh, uh, defecation, which is the uh, elimination of feces. Section 23.2, organization of the digestive system. The abdominal pelvic cavity contains the peritoneal cavity which is lined by a serous membrane that consists of a superficial mesothelium covering a layer of areolar tissue. We can divide the serous membrane into the serosa or visceral peritoneum, which covers the organs within the peritoneal cavity, and the parietal peritoneum, which lines the inner surfaces of the body wall. So the peritoneal cavity is a fluid-filled space between the two peritoneums, and the fluid 
Its purpose is to lubricate mobile organs. Mesentery is a double layer of peritoneum. Layers are fused back to back. It extends from the body wall to the digestive organs, and it provides roots for blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. It also holds organs in place and also stores fat. Intraperitoneal or peritoneal organs, these are the organs that are located within the peritoneum. Whereas re retroperitoneal organs, these are located outside or posterior to the peritoneum. These include most of the pancreas, the duodenum, and parts of the large intestine. Figure 23.4, the peritoneum and mesenteries. So if we start on the top, we're looking at a cross section or transverse section of the abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, notice the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum. Uh, and uh, notice the peritoneal cavity and the uh, section of the elementary canal organs. So most digestive organs are intraperitoneal and are suspended from the body wall by a dorsal mesentery. There are some in intraperitoneal digestive organs that are also suspended from the body wall by ventral mesenteries. And some digestive organs are retroperitoneal because they have lost their mesentery during development. Clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.1. So an inflammation of the peritoneal membrane produces symptoms of peritonitis, which is a painful condition that interferes with the normal functioning of the affected organs. Physical damage, chemical irritation, and bacterial invasion of the peritoneum can lead to severe and even fatal cases of peritonitis. In untreated appendicitis, peritonitis may be caused by the rupturing of the appendix and the subsequent release of bacteria into the peritoneal cavity. Peritonitis is a potentially is a potential complication of any surgery in which the peritoneal cavity is opened or of any disease that perf perforates the walls of the stomach or intestines. Histology of the elementary canal. All digestive organs have the same four basic layers or tunics, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa. So let's start with the mucosa. This is the tunic layer that lines the lumen. It functions, uh, so there's different layers perform one or all three. So it secretes mucus, digestive enzymes and hormones. It absorbs end products of digestion and it protects against infectious disease. And it's made up of uh, three sublayers, the uh, epithelium, which is moistened by glandular secretions, and a lamina pro propria of are areolar tissue, and a mu muscularis mucosae. So the epithelium, um, the mucosal epithelium is either simple or stratified, depending on its location and the stresses to which it is most often subjected. So the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the esophagus, where mechanical stresses are more, most severe, are lined by a stratified squamous epithelium, whereas the stomach, the small intestine, and almost the entire length of the large intestine where absorption occurs have a simple columnar epithelium that contains goblet cells. Okay, so the simple columnar epithelium and mucus secreting cells in most of the tract, right, we said. Uh, so the mouth, esophagus, and anus are made up of the stratified squamous epithelium. So the epithelium secretes mucus, which protects the digestive organs from enzymes and eases food passage, and may secrete enzymes and hormones, for example, in the stomach and in the small intestine. Lamina pro propria is made up of loose areolar connective tissue. It has a rich supply of capillaries that is located here, and it's needed for nourishment and absorption. It also contains lymphoid follicles that help defend against microorganisms. And the follicles are part of malt, which is the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. Uh, then there's the muscularis uh, mucosa. Uh, so in most areas uh, of the digestive tract, the lamina propria contains a narrow band of smooth muscle and elastic fibers. And this band is called the 
muscularis mucosae. So it's smooth muscle that produces local movements of the mucosa. So the inner layer encircles the lumen, which is made up of a circular muscle, and the outer layer contains muscle cells that are oriented parallel to the long axis of the tract. That's the longitudinal layer. And contractions in these layers alter the shape of the lumen and move the epithelial pleats and folds. Layer 23.5, the basic structure of the elementary canal. Uh, so notice the mucosa. So the four basic layers or tunics. So the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. So in the mucosa, it's made up of the epithelium, the lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosae, the three layers. Then we have the submucosa. The muscularis externa is made up of circular, a circular layer of muscles and a longitudinal layer of muscles. And the serosa is made up of connective tissue and epithelium, or known as mesothelium, which I've already mentioned before. The submucosa, which consists of areolar connective tissue, contains blood and lymphatic vessels, lymphoid follicles, and the uh, submucosal nerve plexus, which is also referred to as the plexus of Meissner, which contains sensory neurons, parasympath parasympathetic ganglionic neurons, and sympathetic postganglionic fibers that innervate the mucosa and the submucosa. We're going to talk about these next semester when we look at the uh, autonomic nervous system. Um, so these supplies surround the GI tract tissues. Also has abundant amount of elastic tissues that help organs to regain shape after storing lar a large meal. The muscularis externa is a muscle layer responsible for segmentation and peristalsis. It contains the inner circular muscle layer and the outer longitudinal layers. And the circular layer thickens in some areas to form sphincters. The serosa, so along most portions of the digestive tract, inside the peritoneal cavity, the muscularis externa, is covered by a serous membrane known as the serosa. So it's the outermost layer, which is made up of the visceral peritoneum, formed from areolar connective tissue covered with mesothelium, which is a single layer of squamous epithelium in most organs. And it's replaced by a fibrous adventitia in the esophagus, so dense connective tissue that holds the esophagus to the surrounding structures. Retroperitoneal organs have both an adventitia and a serosa. Again, figure 23.5. If you look at the uh, serosa layer, you can see the connective tissue and uh, the uh, layer of epithelium or mesothelium. Uh, notice the intrinsic nerve plexuses um, that are found there. And, um, and that's it for now. <laughs> Next section is blood supply, splanchnic circulation. So splanchnic uh, circulation includes arteries that branch off the aorta to serve the digestive organs. So these would be the hepatic, going to the liver, spl splenic, going to the spleen, and left gastric arteries going to the stomach, and then the inferior and superior mesenteric arteries going to the intestines. Uh, hepatic portal circulation drains the nutrient-rich blood from the digestive organs to go to the liver. So they deliver blood to the liver for processing. The activities of the digestive system are regulated by neural, hormonal, and local mechanisms. So section 23.3, control of the digestive system. So let's start with the enteric nervous system. So the movement of materials along your digestive tract, as well as many secretory functions, is controlled primarily by neural mechanisms. So the GI tract has its own nervous system, and it's referred to as the enteric nervous system, also called the gut brain, and it contains more neurons than the spinal cord. The gut brain is made up of enteric neurons that communicate extensively with each other. The major nerve supply to the GI tract wall that controls motility. This uh, figure 23.6 has been uh, colored to show the 
enteric nervous system. Uh, so the nervous system located in the uh, digestive system or alimentary canal. Enteric neurons make up bulk of two main interconnecting intrinsic nerve plexuses, the submucosal nerve plexus, which regulates glands and smooth muscle in the mucosa, and the myenteric nerve plexus, which controls the GI tract motility or movement. Enteric nervous system participates in both short and long reflex arcs. So a short reflex is mediated by the enteric nerve plexuses, or the gut brain, and respond to stimuli in the GI tract, whereas long reflexes respond to stimuli arising inside or outside of the gut, such as from the autonomic nervous system. So for example, the parasympathetic system will enhance digestive process processes um, because the parasympathetic a nervous system is also referred to as the rest and digest uh, system, whereas the sympathetic system will inhibit digestion uh, because the sympathetic nervous system mediates the fight or flight response. Figure 23.7, neural reflex pathways initiated by stimuli inside or outside the gastrointestinal tract. So here we'll see the uh, components of the reflex arc. Uh, so the central nervous system is receiving external stimuli. So things like sight, uh, smell, so the sight of food, the smell, the taste, the thought of food also, and internal stimuli, uh, which uh, monitor the central nervous system uh, in terms of changes in the GI tract stretch or in lumen, the pH, nutrients, or solute concentration. So these are part of the short reflexes that occur entirely within the gastrointestinal wall. So the internal stimuli, uh, are uh, these here, are picked up by chemoreceptors, osmoreceptors, or mechanoreceptors. And these uh, bring in the information via what are known afferent, visceral afferent information. So the central nervous system is going to process all these external and internal stimuli, and then is going to make a response and it's going to uh, come out through uh, the intrins extrinsic, visceral, or autonomic efferents. So lo local intrinsic nerve plexus, which is the gut brain, and the effectors are the smooth muscle or glands, and the response is a change in contractile or secretory activity. And this is all part of the long reflexes, and these involve the central nervous system. Three key concepts regulate GI activity. Let's start by looking at the first one. Digestive activity is provoked by a range of mechanical and chemi chemical stimuli. So there are receptors that are located in the walls of the GI tract organs, and these will respond to stretch, changes in the osmolarity and pH, and the presence of substrate and end products of digestion. The second key concept that regulates GI activity are the effectors of the digestive activity, which are the smooth muscle and glands. So when stimulated, the receptors will initiate reflexes that stimulate smooth muscle to mix and move lumen contents. And the reflexes can also activate or inhibit digestive glands that secrete digestive juices or hormones. The third key concept that regulates GI activity are the neurons, and these are both intrinsic and extrinsic, and the hormones that control digestive activity. So in terms of the nervous system control, intrinsic controls involve short reflexes, which are within the enteric nervous system, and extrinsic controls, which involve the long reflexes, which are in the autonomic nervous system, which we mentioned, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. In terms of hormonal controls, so hormones from the cells in the stomach and small intestine regulate, sorry, stimulate target cells in same or different organs to secrete or contract. Part two, functional anatomy of the digestive system. Section 23.4, mouth and associated organs. So the mouth, um, sorry, our exploration of the digestive tract will follow the path of ingested materials from the mouth to the anus. 
So the mouth is where food is chewed and mixed with enzyme containing saliva that begins the process of digestion and swallowing process is initiated. So associated organs include the mouth, the tongue, the salivary glands, and the teeth. So the mouth opens into the oral cavity or buccal cavity, um, which is bounded by lips anteriorly, cheeks laterally, palate superiorly, and tongue inferiorly. The oral orifice is the anterior opening of the mouth, and walls of the mouth are lined with stratified squamous epithelium. These are tough cells that resist abrasion. Remember, we discussed this in the lab. And it, there are cel cells of the gums, hard palate, and part of the tongue are keratinized for extra protection. Remember, keratin is that uh, dead layer of uh, epithelial cells on the surface. Next are the uh, lips and cheeks. So the lips, or labia, are composed of fleshy, orbicularis oris muscle. The cheeks is composed of the buccinator muscles. The oral vestibule, it's recess internal to the lips and cheeks, external to the teeth and gums. The oral cavity proper lies within the teeth and the gums, and the labial frenulum is median attachment of each lip to the gum. 23.8a anatomy of the oral cavity or mouth we can see the um, the oral cavity and um, uh, superiorly would be the hard palate and we can see the soft palate and the um, tongue so the palate forms the roof of the mouth and has two distinct parts the hard palate and the soft palate so the hard palate is formed by palatine bones and palatine processes of the maxillae with a midline ridge called raphi. Mucosa is slightly corrugated to help create friction against the tongue. The soft palate is a fold formed mostly of skeletal muscle, closes off the nasopharynx during swallowing. Laterally, the soft palate is anchored to the tongue by the palatoglossal arches, also anchored to the wall of the oropharynx by the palatopharyngeal arches, and the area in between the two arches is called the fauces. Uh, palatine tonsils are located in the fauces. The ovula is a finger-like projection that faces downward from the free edge of the soft palate. 28. 23.8b, the anatomy of the oral cavity or the mouth. So notice the, um, the uh, ovula, okay? The tongue, the lingual frenulum, uh, the sublingual fold with openings of the sublingual ducts. Uh, notice the oral vestibule, the gums. Um, notice the inferior labial frenulum, uh, hard palate, soft palate, um, palatine tonsil, palatopharyngeal arch, and palatoglossal arch, and the superior labial frenulum, uh, and also the palatine raphi. Notice how the hard palate is corrugated. It's a new term I learned, actually. <laughs> okay. So the tongue manipulates materials inside the mouth and is occasionally used to bring foods, such as ice cream, into the oral cavity. So the tongue occupies the floor of the mouth. It's composed of interlacing bundles of skeletal muscle. Functions include gripping, repositioning, and mixing of food during chewing. Formation of a bolus, which is a mixture of food and saliva. Initiation of swallowing, speech, and taste. So intrinsic muscles change the shape of the tongue. Extrinsic muscle muscles alter the tongue's position. And the lingual frenulum is, a, is the attachment to the floor of the mouth. So this, if you look at the surface of the tongue, the superior surface bears papillae, which are peg-like projections of underlying mucosa. So there are four types. The filiform papillae gives the tongue the roughness to provide friction, only one that does not contain taste buds, all the other ones do, and gives the tongue a whitish appearance. The fungiform papillae are kind of mushroom-shaped and scattered widely over the tongue, it's the vascular cord that causes the reddish appearance of the tongue. Uh, 
and the valate or circumvallate papillae, which are 8 to 12 form V-shaped row in back of the tongue. And the foliate papillae are located on the lateral aspects of the posterior tongue. The terminal sulcus is a groove located posterior to the valate papillae and marks the division between the body and the root. So the body is the portion of the tongue that resides in the oral cavity, whereas the root is the posterior third residing in the oral pharynx. This section does not contain papillae, but it's still bumpy because of lingual tonsil, which lies deep to its mucosa. Figure 23.9, the dorsal surface of the tongue and the tonsils. So if we start in the back, we can see the lingual tonsil, um, the uh, terminal sulcus, which is that groove located posterior to the valate papillae, foliate papillae, uh, the um, fungiform papilla and the filiform papilla. And notice the medial sulcus of the tongue dividing the tongue into right and left aspect. Clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.2. So if the lingual frenulum is too restrictive, you cannot eat or speak normally. So if it's properly diagnosed, the condition is known as ankyloglossia. So this is, uh, can be corrected surgically. So it's a congenital condition in which children are born with an extremely short lingual frenulum. It's often referred to as tongue-tied, refused tongue, restricted tongue movement, distorted speech. And so basically they snip off the frenulum surgically. Salivary glands. So there are three pairs of salivary glands that secrete into the oral cavity. Each pair has a distinctive cellular organization and produces saliva, which is a mixture of glandular secretions with slightly different properties. So functions of the saliva are to cleanse the mouth, dissolve food chemicals for taste, moisten the food and compact it into a bolus, and also begin the breakdown of starch with the enzyme amylase. So most saliva is produced by the major extrinsic salivary glands located outside the oral cavity, whereas minor salivary glands are scattered throughout the oral cavity and augment slightly. The major salivary glands include the parotid, per, uh, uh, the submandibular, and the sublingual. So the parotid is anterior to the ear and external to the masseter muscle. The parotid duct opens into the oral vestibule next to the second upper uh, molar. Um, what else can I say about these? So these produce a thick, serous secretion containing large amounts of salivary, salivary amylase. The submandibular glands are medial to the body of the mandible, and the duct opens at the base of the lingual uh, frenulum. And um, these glands produce a watery mucus secretion that acts as a buffer and lubricant, whereas the sublingual glands are anterior to the submandibular glands under the tongue, and it opens via 10 to 12 ducts into the floor of the mouth. These will secrete a mixture of buffers, glycoproteins called mucins, and salivary amylase. Figure 2310A, the salivary glands. So notice the masseter muscle. I know it's not a gland, but just find the location of the masseter muscle. So notice the large parotid gland, parotid gland um, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the right there. And then find the submandibular uh, gland and find the sublingual gland. Sublingual is underneath the tongue. Salivary glands are composed of two types of secretory cells. The serous cells produce the watery secretion, enzymes, ions, and a bit of mucin. The mucus cells will produce mucus. So the parotid and submandibular glands contain mostly serous cells, but the sublingual gland consists mostly of mucus cells. Call homeostatic imbalance 23.3. There's a condition known as zero stomia which is dry mouth, which is an uncomfortable condition caused by too little saliva being produced. 
So normal salivary gland function is vital for oral health. Lack of moisture may lead to difficulty with chewing and swallowing, as well as oral infections. This can be caused by medications, uh, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, and Jogren's uh, syndrome, which is an autoimmune disease affecting the moisture-producing glands throughout the body. I also want to add one other um, um, clinical imbalance, uh, and this year is going to be more relevant next semester when we, uh, uh, well, no, actually, no, next year in microbiology. So it's the mumps virus. So the mumps, you may have heard of the mumps. It's a virus, uh, it's mo and, and most often will target the salivary glands, especially the parotid salivary glands, although other organs can also become infected. And the infection typically occurs at between five to nine years of age. So the first exposure stimulates the production of antibodies and in most cases confers permanent immunity. Active immunity can be conferred by immunization. So uh, getting a vaccine, basically. In post-adolescent males, the mumps virus can also infect the testes and cause sterility. If there's an infection of the pancreas by the mumps virus, it can produce temporary or permanent diabetes. So, um, so the, an effective uh, mumps vaccine is available and uh, would prevent any of these from happening. So composition of saliva, it's mostly water, about uh, 97 to 99.5%. So it's hypoosmotic. Uh, so it's slightly acidic, pH 6.75 to 7. The electrolytes are sodium, potassium, chloride, phosphate, and bicarbonate. Salivary amylase and lingual lipase. Proteins are mucin, lysozyme, um, which is an enzyme that targets gram-positive bacteria, and IgA, which is a type of antibody. Uh, metabolic wastes found in saliva are urea and uric acid. So lysozyme, IgA, defensins, and nitric oxide from nitrates in food protect against microorganisms. So just one more thing, a continuous background, of, background level of secretion flushes the oral surfaces, keeping, helping keep them clean. Um, also, about 70% of the saliva originates in the submandibular salivary glands, 25% in the parotids, and the remaining 5% in the sublingual salivary glands. Control of salivation, so 1,500 mils of, per day can be produced. The minor glands continuously keep the mo mo mouth moist. Major salivary glands are activated by the parasympathetic nervous system when ingested food stimulates chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors that are located in the mouth, sending signals to the saliva salivatory nuclei in the brain stem. These are all regions that we'll talk about next semester in anatomy and physiology too, by the way. And the salivatory nuclei stimulate the parasympathetic impulses along fibers in cranial nerves 7 and 9 to the glands. I will not ask this on a test, though. Uh, strong sympathetic stimulation inhibits salivation results in dry mouth or z uh, zero stomia. You may have experienced that when stressed. When we're stressed, we have a dry mouth. Uh, smell, sight of food, or upset GI uh, can act as a stimulus. Clinical uh, homeostatic imbalance, 23.4. So the decaying primary teeth can be painful and may lead to serious infection. So primary teeth deserve as much attention as permanent teeth. I know a lot of parents say, well, you know, they'll fall off, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's not the case. So primary teeth serve as important placeholders for developing permanent teeth. So the primary teeth can be kept healthy by brushing and limiting exposure to sugary liquids, especially from prolonged bottle feeding. So juices, not a good idea. Movements of the tongue are important in passing food across the opposing surfaces of the teeth. So the teeth lie in sockets, in gum-covered margins of the mandible and maxilla. Mastication is uh, simply the process of chewing that tears and grinds food into smaller bits. Uh, dentition and the dental formula. So 
Primary dentition consists of 20 deciduous teeth or milk or baby teeth that erupt between 6 and 24 months of age. And uh, deciduous means just like deciduous leaves, they fall off. And 32 deep-lying permanent teeth that enlarge and develop while roots of milk teeth are resorbed from below, causing them to loosen and fall out. It occurs around 6 to 12 years of age. All, about, all but third molars or wisdom teeth are in by the end of the adolescence. Third molars may or may not emerge around 17 to 25 years of age. So the teeth are classified according to shape. Incisors, these uh, chisel shaped for cutting. Canines are fang-like teeth that tear or pierce. And premolars or bicuspids are broad, have broad crowns with rounded cusps used to grind or crush. All but third molars or wisdom teeth are in by the end of adolescence. The third molars may or may not emerge around 17 to 25 years of age. So teeth are classified according to the shape. Incisors are uh, chisel shaped for cutting. Uh, incisor, incisors are useful for clipping or cutting, such as when you nip off the tip of a carrot stick. These teeth have a single root. Canines are fang-like teeth that tear or pierce. Uh, they're conical in shape, and um, you might weaken a tough piece of celery by the clipping action of the incisors, but then take advantage of the shearing action provided by the cuspids. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, premolars uh, or bicuspids, uh, these have flattened crowns with prominent ridges. They crush, mash, and grind. Bicuspids have one or two roots. By the way, cuspids or canines are the same thing. And um, yes, that's it for that. Finally, molars have very large flattened crowns with prominent ridges. They excel at crushing and grinding you can usually shift a tough nut or some spare ribs to your bicuspids and molars for successful crunching. Molars typically have three or more roots. Figure 23.11, human dentition. So in uh, the top figure, those are the milk teeth or the deciduous teeth. Let's start with the incisors in the front. There's the central ones, a pair of central ones and a pair of lateral ones. And in brackets, it tells you the uh, month or year of eruption. So uh, on either side, we have the canines and then we have the molars and second molars. So a total of 20 teeth. For the permanent teeth, uh, if you look at the incisors, the central ones and the lateral ones, these come out are around seven to eight years of, uh, of age. Then the canines, then the premolars or bicuspids, uh, second premolars, and then we have the molars, uh, the, f uh, the first molar, second molar, and third molar. Those are the wisdom teeth that may or may not emerge uh, between 17 and 25 years of age. So here there's 32 teeth. Dental formula is the shorthand indicator of number and position of teeth. It shows the ratio of the upper to lower teeth for only half of the mouth. The other side is a mirror image. So for the primary teeth, you have two incisors, one canine, two molars in the upper jaw, lower jaw, same thing, multiply by two, that would give you 20 teeth in total. For the permanent teeth, uh, there are two incisors, one canine, two uh, premolars, three molars, uh, same thing in the lower jaw, multiply by two, and that would give you 32 teeth. So tooth structure, each tooth has two major regions, the crown and the root. So the crown is the exposed part above the gum or gingiva. Uh, it's covered by enamel, which is the hardest substance in the body. It's heavily mi mineralized with calcium salts and hydroxy ap uh, crystals. Uh, the animal, animal producing cells degenerate when the tooth erupts, so no healing if tooth decays or cracks, and that would require uh, artificial repair by a filling. The root is the portion that's embedded in the jawbone, and it's connected to the crown by the neck. Um, so, um, moving right along in, 
tooth structure. So canines, incisors, and premolars, as we said, have only one root. The first upper premolars often has two. Sorry, the first upper premolar is singular, often has two. The first two upper molars have three roots. The first two lower molars have two roots. And the third molar roots vary, often single fused root. So the, um, there's uh, other structures associated with the tooth. Cement is the calcified connective tissue. It covers the root. It attaches it to the periodontal ligament. The periodontal ligament forms a fibrous joint called gymphosis. Uh, which we're going to talk about uh, next semester, this type of joint. It anchors a tooth in a bony socket called the alveolus. Gingival sulcus is the groove where the gingiva um, borders the tooth. And dentin is the bone-like material under the enamel. It's maintained by odontoblasts of the pulp cavity. Structures are the pulp cavity surrounded by dentin. The pulp is connective tissue and blood vessels and nerves. A root canal, uh, as the pulp cavity extends to the root, the apical foramen is at the proximal end of the root, and this is the entry point for blood vessels, nerves, etc. 23.12, this is a longitudinal section of a canine tooth within its bony socket or alveolus. So notice on the left the crown, the neck, and the root. On the right, we can see the tooth enamel, the dentin, uh, then we have the pulp cavity, which contains blood vessels and nerves. Uh, notice the gingival sulcus and the gingival, which is the gum, the cement, the root canal, the periodontal ligament that holds it in place in the alveolus, uh, apical foramen, and then notice how it's embedded in the bone. Clinical homeostatic imbalance 23.5. An impacted tooth is a tooth that remains trapped in the jawbone. It can cause a good deal of pressure and pain. Uh, wisdom teeth are most commonly involved. And the treatment is surgical removement. Or in my case, <laughs> my dentist just gave up. <laughs> it was just impossible to, to remove. So other um, dental problems. So tooth and gum disease. So dental caries or cavities... Uh, is caused by demineralization of enam enam enamel sorry, and dentin from bacterial action. So it's a mass of plaque deposit protects the bacteria that normally reside in the mouth from salivary secretions. So as the pathogenic bacteria digest nutrients, they generate acids that erode the enamel and dentin of the teeth. The result is dental caries or cavities. And the bacterium that is responsible for this is Streptococcus mutans, okay, which we'll hear about next year in microbiology. So it's the most abundant bacterium at these sites. And now they're actually developing vaccines to promote resistance to it and thereby prevent dental caries. So the dental plaque is a film of sugar, bacteria, and debris that adheres to sticks to the teeth. So the acid from the bacteria dissolves the calcium salts. Proteolytic enzymes digest organic matter. And the best way to prevent this is daily flossing and brushing the exposed surfaces of your teeth after you eat, um, especially after you eat something that is uh, sweet. Gingivitis uh, is when the plaque calcifies to form a calculus, which is tartar. Calculus disrupts the seal between the gingiva uh, and the teeth. Uh, anaerobic bacteria infect gum. So anaerobic means that they are in the absence of oxygen. And infection is reversible if the calculus is removed. So it's very important to uh, visit your dentist uh, at least once a year to remove the tartar. Periodontitis or periodontal disease is if... Uh, you do not treat the gingivitis, so it can escalate into this disease. Uh, at this point, the immune cells will attack not only bacterial intruders, but also the body tissues. So it can destroy the periodontal ligament, remember the ligament that holds the tooth in place in its socket, and can activate the osteoclast, which leads to dissolving of bone and possible tooth loss. 
uh, and may also increase heart disease and stroke in two ways, because it can promote atherosclerotic plaque formation, and bacteria entering the blood can cause clot formation in the coronary and cerebral arteries. So when you hear the dentist uh, saying that uh, oral health is related to heart health, they are right. Uh, so some risk factors would be smoking, uh, diabetes, mellitus, and oral piercings uh, as well. The first place along the entire digestive tract is traditionally the mouth. So let's start there. The mouth is also known as the oral cavity or buccal cavity. The functions of the mouth include sensation, you feel things with your mouth, mastication, which is chewing, chemical digestion, swallowing, as well as speech and respiration. There are some components we have to be aware of that make up the structures of the mouth. We have the cheeks and lips, the tongue, as well as the teeth. The cheeks and lips are like the goalies of a hockey game. It keeps things in play. The cheeks and lips are going to keep the food inside the mouth as well as push it back between the teeth. So as you're chewing, it keeps it from falling out of your mouth as well as kind of keeps it between the teeth, which is where you need for a mastication. The cheeks and lips are also important for speech as well as blowing and sucking. The tongue is a muscle. It moves the food between the teeth. So as you're chewing, num, 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 the tongue is constantly moving things back to the teeth, turning them around, pushing them back to the teeth. It also deals with sensory. This is where you taste your gustation. Okay, This is how you taste. It helps with your speech. It also helps propel food down the throat in the form of a bolus. So as you're chewing up your food, your tongue also acts like a catapult. It's going to help you shove the food down your throat for swallowing. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue is called the body. This is found in the oral cavity. It's attached to the floor of the mouth by something called the lingual frenulum. The posterior one-third of the tongue is called the root. Next up are your teeth. Collectively, the teeth are known as your dentition. You have baby teeth and you have adult teeth. Your baby teeth are known as deciduous teeth baby teeth, otherwise known as milk teeth, and there are 20 total. Then you get your permanent teeth, otherwise known as your adult teeth, and those are 32 total. And by the way, numbers sometimes show up on your exam, so be sure to memorize how many baby teeth somebody has, as well as how many adult teeth somebody has. And believe me when I say this, it's easier to memorize the number than to sit in a test and do this. I'd had to do that. Anyhow, let's move on to the types of teeth. In this graphic, you can see we have different types of teeth. We have what we call incisors. These are your cutting teeth. Your canines, these are your puncturing and shredding teeth, also very popular with the vampires. We have the premolars, which are crushing and grinding teeth. And we have our molars, which are also crushing and grinding teeth. Teeth, of course, have to have some anatomy to them. So we have things that are based on their arrangement to the gum. Okay, you've got the gum line. Depending on where the, te the tooth is on the gum determines the region that we call it. So for example, we have the crown, which is the portion of the tooth that is above the gum. The neck, which is where the crown and the part below it meet, the root. And of course, the root, which is the portion below the gum line. Other structures to know on the teeth include the dentin, which is a hard yellowish tissue. It's connective tissue. We have enamel, and we have cementum, which is connective tissue. Within the tooth, we have things like the pulp cavity, and the surface area where the teeth come together is called the occlusion. So we have the occlusal surface. Finally, we have something called mastication, We're talking about chewing here. In the skeletal muscle videos, in the muscular system videos, we took a look specifically at the muscles of mastication. So if you need to go look those up, that's where you'll find those. Mastication is basically the process of breaking food into smaller pieces. What occurs here is that by chewing the food, we're exposing more of the food to digestive enzymes. Next is saliva, otherwise known as spit. The saliva has a very important job. It's going to help moisten the food as well as help inhibit bacteria growing in the mouth. It is the first digestive enzyme that food will encounter. 
it kind of sort of starts the digestion process of starch. And there's other things more powerful, but saliva begins some of the process on the digestion. It will lubricate the food, allowing you to swallow it easier. If it doesn't lubricate, it's going to be like swallowing pieces of chalk. So the saliva helps to lubricate the food so you can get it down your food tube even better. And no, we're not going to leave it at food tube. We'll get into an entire video on what the food tube technically is called. And the saliva finally comes from the salivary glands. The salivary glands are the glands that are going to produce the saliva. You have things like the parotid gland, which is anterior in front of the earlobes, the submandibular gland, it's found around halfway along the body of the mandible, that's your jawbone, and the sublingular gland, which is on the floor of the mouth. In our next video, as I promised, we're going to take a closer look at what we mean by food tube.